and welcome to today's event hosted by NUS Cities. For those who don't know about NUS Cities, we are a university-wide, multidisciplinary, open and inclusive collaborative platform hosted within the College of Design and Engineering. Through our collaborations with local and international institutions, we hope to create synergies that extend within as well as beyond NUS. Before we begin the public lecture, we would like to take this opportunity to announce and award the winners of the Livable Cities Best Project Competition. NUS Cities is heavily engaged in nurturing the next generation of urban professionals through its education pillar. One of the key ways is through its common curriculum course at the NUS College of Design and Engineering called Livable Cities. Today, we'll be presenting the prizes for the best student projects from Livable Cities course for August semester of the academic year 2023-24. The Livable Cities module aims to encourage students to think through an interdisciplinary and urban systems approach towards the problems that cities face today. Undergraduate students are grouped into interdisciplinary groups and are assigned sites all over Singapore. Studio leaders and teaching assistants then guide the teams through the semester in identifying relevant problems through site visits and research, and then using a systems thinking approach to come up with innovative solutions. Through the Livable Cities Best Project Competition, we would like to encourage students' interest and passion in cities, which is relevant and critical to tackle the complex evolving problems of today's world. From over 120 projects, the following two projects were selected as winners for this academic semester. Firstly, we would like to thank our kind sponsors, the Urban Land Institute, otherwise known as ULI, and DP Architects for their generosity in making this competition possible. Each team will be receiving a student membership per person from the Urban Land Institute, as well as a cash prize of $250 per team from DP Architects. The two winning teams are being awarded these prizes on an equal basis. May I now invite the Chair of ULI Singapore and the Managing Director and Head of Asia Pacific PGIM Real Estate, Mr. Bennett Yasara, as well as Ms. Chan Hyumin, Director at DP Architects, to come forward to present the award to the winning teams. The first winning project is titled Project Transit. The group aimed to improve the commute experience for transit users within Pungol Town, where they experience crowd congestion and safety standards during peak periods. The project exhibited strong systems thinking in integrating what would be otherwise three isolated solutions, oh, three isolated solutions into one, with an app acting as the enabler for the placement of stop signs to nudge delivery drivers to exhibit safe behavior, and for an autonomous vehicle system meant to divert commuters away from the LRT. The team consists of Atalia Tan Hui Sien, Go Bing Jin, um, Xia Ching Shi Klu, Calvin Ku Wei In, Veril Ivan Chandra. May I now invite the studio leaders who guided this particular team, uh, Ms. Yong Lee and Dr. Lok Wai Chong, to join for the photo session. Well done, team. The second winning project is titled Ripple Effect, Reimagine, Revitalize, and Rejuvenate the Singapore River. The team aimed to introspect a possibility of revitalizing the Singapore River to provide meaning and significance for citizens in their everyday life. 
The project impressed their judges in not just providing an attractive solution in the form of naturalizing parts of the Singapore River with greenery while creating more social spaces, but also in providing a thoughtful plan for how the solution could be implemented. The team consists of Lee, Ka Lee Kai Xuan, Xia Jin Bao Darren, Ho Tiong Teng Shan, Xin Jing Yi Vanessa, Go Nyo Shi, Fiona Sh Fiona Shopei Shuen. Um, may I invite the students uh, up to the dais, please? May I also invite the studio leader who guided uh, this team towards this project, uh, Mr. Lee Kuang Weng. <laughs> well done, team. If you would like to know more about these winning projects, you can view their detailed proposals uh, on the NUS City's website under the education portal. We will now be starting with the public lecture, but before we start the event, just a general reminder to please ensure your devices are on silent mode or powered off. Welcome to the eighth public lecture hosted by NUS Cities. The NUS Cities public lecture series will investigate policies, ideas, and projects developed by urban experts which aspire to create sustainable, resilient, and livable cities. Through the lecture series, we hope to create a platform for discussion, introspection, and conversation to give momentum to the ongoing research and exploration regarding issues concerning cities. I would now like to introduce our guest speaker for the evening. Mr. John Kirkaw is a senior urban development specialist with the World Bank's Sustainable Development Practice Group. He leads numerous country and city engagements, investment operations, and advisory and analytical work in the Middle East and North Africa region, as well as in the South Asia region. He's the author of several recent global reports, including the upcoming Vibrant Cities on the Bedrock of Stability, Prosperity, and Sustainability, and uh, the, recently, the, the, the report released in 2020, The Hidden Wealth of Cities Creating Financial and Managing Public Spaces. Prior to joining the World Bank, he held various key positions at URA in Singapore, where he led technical and policy works on urban planning, design, property land markets, and urban residence. He holds a master's degree with a specialization in urbanization and real estate from Howard University, as well as a master's degree in architecture from Columbia University. He received his bachelor's degree from the National University of Singapore, and we are very, very happy to have him today to speak to us. May I now invite him on stage? Okay. Thank you so much, Sanjana. Indeed, uh, I graduated from NUS, uh, I think, more than 20 years ago. So the last time I stepped in this building was a very long time ago. So very nostalgic to be back. You have a fancy new uh, lecture theater, which I didn't have, and lots of uh, equipment, uh, two screens, very fancy. But first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Ku Teng Chai for inviting me to speak uh, at this lecture, and also to NUS Cities for having me. I know this is the time of the year where everyone is just looking forward to the holidays, so really appreciate you coming down and listening to what I have to say. Today, I'm going to structure my presentation into three parts. The first is really to introduce you uh, what my organization does, the World Bank, just very briefly. Before I jump into an introduction and overview of a forthcoming report, it's called Vibrant Cities. Um, and the word vibrancy, it's not about people on the ground and you know, that sort of vibrancy. I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit. And then I'll, I'll, I'll also share with you some of the actual work we do on the ground. Uh, I'm currently working with uh, the city of Amman in Jordan on a city transformation uh, investments and, and strategy. 
I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to try to make it as interactive as possible. So uh, I hope you'll participate. I'll, this is the first time I'm doing this, so please bear with me. Okay, so let's start. So just a bit of, my, of the World Bank, what we do. Uh, just out of curiosity, anybody knows what the World Bank does? I see nobody's nodding heads. Nobody, yeah? Okay. So the World Bank mission is, uh, our vision is to create a world free of poverty on a livable planet. So the word livable planet just recently came in with our new president because we're looking into public goods as well, climate change and all that stuff. And our mission is to end extreme poverty and to boost prosperity on a livable planet. The World Bank does many things to provide countries, regions, cities uh, with financing and non-lending services, basically technical assistance. We look at policy reforms, sustainable investments, knowledge, uh, good practices, and implementation capacity. What is the World Bank, you might ask? It's a multilateral development bank. It was conceived in 1946 as one of the two Bretton Woods institutions, along with the IMF. Uh, it has 189 member countries, Singapore being one of them. Uh, it's a specialized agency of the UN, but it has independent governance and management structure. We offer financial as well as advisory services across a range of sectors. And it was initially set up to support the post-war reconstruction of Europe and Japan. But now we support development efforts of a broad range of countries. The World Bank is among the world's largest source of development assistance. We have a last fiscal year, sorry, this fiscal year, last fiscal year, we have uh, annual lending of about $73 billion. Uh, uh, and our reimbursable advisory services for the Gulf countries alone, where I'm working in, is about 50 million. Our funding sources is from the wealthier countries of, um, of the world, uh, but also raising capital through capital markets. And the World Bank has a triple A rating. And the World Bank Group consists of five institutions. So I represent the two institutions, the IBRD, International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, as well as the International Development Association. IBRD is the agency that gives concessionary loans to um, middle-income countries and low-income countries. Uh, IDA gives credits, grants to uh, low-income countries. IFC works on private sector, as you may know. MIGA is the agency that looks at guarantees uh, to provide uh, risk mitigation for um, for loans, and we have ICSID, which is looking at inv investments disputes. So even though we, I work at the IBRD and IDA, sometimes we also collaborate uh, with the IFC. So the World Bank has many practice areas, and this is just a list of them. Uh, I'm from the Urban Disaster Risk uh, Resilience and Land. Uh, that's over here. And um, but it doesn't mean that we don't work across different practice groups. We work very closely with the transport group, the digital development group, water group, social, poverty, energy, and so on and so forth. So depending on the work we do, we sometimes have to work across different global practices. And then there are global teams who are very big on climate change, fragility, conflict, and violence, gender, and infrastructure. So what exactly do I do in the urban resilience and land business lines? Uh, urban. We look at housing, urban upgrading, cultural heritage, basic services, transport, uh, territorial development, governance and municipal finance, and services like solid waste management. Disaster risk, we look at disaster response, post-disaster conflict res uh, reconstruction, uh, and early warning systems. On the land, we look at land and property registration, urban planning capacity. I personally work on three countries in the Middle East. Uh, Jordan, the GCC, and Egypt. So GCC is the Gulf countries. I work specifically in Saudi Arabia, giving advice for land and, uh, land and asset management. In Jordan, I'm working a lot on uh, transit-oriented development. In Egypt, I'm looking at, looking at decentralization and improving capacity uh, at the government level. We have all together in the MENA region 13 landing operations of almost $3 billion. Um, it's multi-sectoral in nature. And we also do a lot of analytical and knowledge support. And we partner with a lot of UN agencies. My colleagues, they work in very difficult regions as well. 
Palestine, Lebanon, Iraq, Tunisia, Morocco, we have a big program, uh, Yemen and Djibouti as well. So this is just uh, an overview of the stuff that my team is doing uh, in the Middle East. Okay, so that's the World Bank. Let me jump into a very exciting piece of work that has not been released, it's forthcoming, but if you actually Google it on uh, the internet, you can actually find the report, but we haven't really launched it officially yet. It's called Vibrant Cities, on the bedrock of stability, prosperity, and sustainability. So making our cities vibrant and dynamic is even more critical today as the overall economic growth prospects of emerging markets and developing economies are weakening. These economies are growing ever into tighter spaces in terms of global trade due to fragmentation and growing trade restrictions, uh, in terms of domestic policy options due to populist pressures, and in terms of climate change and sustainability imperatives. Government debt is also at an all-time high, with many middle-income countries more severely indebted than ever. Their growth problem is getting harder, and the question for us is how cities can bring about... Sorry. How can cities enhance inclusivity, remain centers of economic growth, and become more resilient to shocks and low carbon at the same time? So that's a very difficult question. So... When I talk about vibrant cities, uh, vibrant cities set out to answer these very questions. Uh, and what do we mean by the term vibrant city? It comes down to offering firms and households high expectations of reaping returns on their investments. Be it physical, human, or other forms of capital, expectations for a sustainable and resilient future, and for growth to be inclusive. To do this, tomorrow's vibrant cities will need to be first and foremost productive, driving economic growth, creating jobs, boosting incomes and financial, financing critical social and infrastructure investments. Next, to be inclusive, enabling all residents to aspire realistically to, be, to, to lead a better life through investments in skills and through equitable access to job opportunities. And, um, sorry. So our research on these dimensions of vibrant cities has highlighted three key challenges. First, cities in developing economies find themselves with something we call sterile agglomeration. This, is, this means crowded, yet deprived of productivity gains. Cities in developing economies are not enhancing productivity as seen in more developed countries. Economic research has shown that productivity and innovation facilitated by the, by the city's economic density, and I'll talk about this a little bit more, are the main drivers for long-run economic growth. However, developing countries are not so much densely productive as just being simply crowded. So there's a difference between good density and, and bad density. We, we turn bad density as, as sterile agglomeration. In fact, cities in MENA are quite prominent in their limited productivity. They have a lower share of employment in tradable sectors. When I talk about traders, tradable sectors, what I mean is sectors that can be exported externally. It's not just within the country, but you know, for example, in finance, you're not just serving the country, but you're actually exporting some of these services abroad, right? The problem is amplified by bad urban design and lack of capital investments in cities. In fact, rising urban costs in congestion, pollution, and crime dampen a city's productivity. In Asian cities, a high share of jobs are in the tradable sector, and these include manufacturing and global services. It is only jobs in the tradable sectors that increase productivity through the exchange of knowledge and ideas through trade, foreign direct investments and licensing. Structural transformations have also been sluggish in many developing economies, which limits the mass of industrial or service firms that can benefit from agglomeration. So I want to take a moment to extend the benefits of good density in agglomeration. Right. Agglomeration and specialization are two dynamics that enhance job creation and economic prosperity. And these forces benefit from concentrating, concentrating economic activity geographically. So let me, 
let me explain in simpler terms, right? So, um, for instance, in Singapore, you have very good urban planning thanks to URA. So you facilitate growth. There's demand for land. People want to build high. And you create a CBD, say Tanjong Paga, for example. And that's where all the lawyers come. They want to do international arbitration, for instance. So they exchange ideas, exchange services, and create high-value services that can go beyond Singapore, right? So these services are not just within the neighborhood or even the country, but also beyond. And that's specialization. Uh, that's specialization, right? Um, and cities need to be spatially connected, dense with people, and transit-oriented, not sprawling, that perpetuates the dispersion of jobs and people. Planners and regulators can attract firms to invest in cities by reducing frictions such as zoning regulations, uh, challenges in doing business, and limiting information. The research also tells us that agglomeration premiums on labor productivity nearly disappears after controlling for urban costs. In fact, for developed economies, doubling of urban population would lead to a 5% increase in labor productivity. These gains are more limited in developing countries at around 2%. However, when urban congestion costs and crime congestion and housing are all taken into account, increasing city size, in fact, lowers productivity. Many cities can no longer lay claim to being lands of opportunity for all residents or escalators, out of uh, escalators for prosperity. Large cities often show higher income inequality and here is a picture of a slum neighborhood in Mumbai. Some of you may have seen it before as you take the airplane and land in Mumbai. It's one of the largest slums in Mumbai. But they're next to homes that are priced at millions of dollars, right? So that inequality is very stark in some cities. We find a trend where large cities in developing countries exhibit higher within city inequality than smaller ones, as you see on the chart. Intra-city income inequality needs not cause grave concern when it is driven by entrepreneurship. So some inequality is okay, especially when it's driven by innovation, entrepreneurship, and stronger efforts by individual workers. For example, higher intra-inequality typically appears in productive cities that attract classes of skilled workers with higher earning power. But when inequality is exacerbated by a socially unfair distribution of opportunity, policymakers should raise the alarm. In many cases, the outcomes for individuals in a city depend on their family background, ethnicity, gender, race, birthplace, and so on. When a child is born into a wealthy family, pulls ahead simply because of his birth circumstance, not through individual effort or talent, this inequality is unfair. The third challenge is that poor people in developing countries are most vulnerable to natural hazards. Around the world, rising greenhouse gases emissions are increasing climate-related risk and environmental risk to people's lives and livelihoods. In cases of flooding and extreme rainfall, cities in low-income countries suffer the greatest economic harm. Our research has shown that the impact of climate shocks often fall heavily on vulnerable groups such as women, school-aged school age children, and informal and unskilled workers. The chart here shows that flooding in Accra results in significant asset loss for a larger share of poor than non-poor households, despite their having similar probability of being affected. In other countries like Bangladesh, poor people report losing 70% of their incomes following a disaster, and non-poor people, 45%. In Morocco, Economically and socially vulnerable groups, including women, the elderly, persons with disabilities, and others are disproportionately exposed to climate-related disasters, especially flooding. And here we also face another additional di dilemma. We find that economic growth strengthens resilience, but can also exacerbate global warming. As cities rise in population and incomes, they tend to generate increasing GHG emissions with the urban middle class growing and consuming higher demands, higher amounts of energy, intensive goods and services, durable transportation, housing, and other structures. 
despite covering than less than 3% of the world's land area, urban areas currently account for roughly two-thirds of global energy consumption, emits 5.1 gigatons of air carbon annually, accounting for 14% of global emissions and 23% of urban emissions. The top emitters are Tokyo, New York, Chicago, Guangzhou, Dortmund, and Beijing, in that order, each emitting more than 100 million tons a year. Finding strategies to control GHG in all urban areas, rich and poor, is a vital task for policymakers globally. So how can city leaders build tomorrow's vibrant cities? The main message of the report is that city leaders need to deepen city finance and enhance city governance. And this will take building trust and legitimacy. The chart in front of you shows that decentralized spending is very low in the Middle East and North Africa, and for the most part, own source revenues are low. So own source revenues are revenues that the city gains and collects on its own and is able to spend. For city leaders to implement reforms and raise revenue, they need to learn legitimacy and trust. These are two elements of a social contract. Legitimacy is the ability of leaders to win compliance with new laws or public orders because people share a widespread belief that others are also complying. Trust consists in the belief that others are behaving cooperatively in society or politics motivating cooperative behavior. By building trust and legitimacy at all layers of governance, a city can move from a low-performance, low-accountability equilibrium to a high-performance, high-accountability equilibrium. Casablanca is a shiny example here. A key aspect of local service delivery in Moroccan cities, but especially prevalent in Casablanca, is the use of delegated service providers and public sector companies as parties contracted by the city government to manage municipal services. The relationship between the city and delegated um, service providers is governed by a law that aims in particular to promote transparency in the awarding of management agreements and to promote a balanced contractual relationship between the delegator and delegatee. The top officials of these service providers are appointed through relatively transparent and competitive process, which implies that intrinsically motivated officials are selected for these assignments. The use of delegated public services has enabled Casablanca to increase investments in urban infrastructure and services and delegated management has also been recognized to have contributed to modernizing management practices in this sector, professionalizing jobs, and introducing inform information systems through staff training. These factors have improved the quality of municipal services. Finally, I'd like to end with the key policy principles of inform, support, and protect that can be built on the bedrock of trust and legitimacy. First is to inform market actors to motivate the private decisions and investments that make cities vibrant. For example, in terms of emissions, globally comparable publicly disclosed metrics on city level GHG emissions will incentivize people and businesses, as well as city and country governments to make more calibrated approaches to low carbon development. Similarly, zoning and other regulations need to signal to private investors that the use of scarce urban land can respond to market forces evolving as the city evolves. Next is to support markets through rigorous and economically defensible public investments in connectivity and service provision. For example, inclusion needs digital connectivity and efficient transport connections that are vital for expanding livelihoods, opportunities, and for effectively matching jobs and skills. Inclusion also requires basic sanitation, health services, and access to high quality education Making service providers accountable to citizens is also very key. Then, protect urban populations as needed in a targeted, timely, and town-bound fashion. For example, protect urban poor residents with augmented safety nets as a short-term to medium-term buffer against destitution and adverse shocks. Such shocks include job losses, health crises, and disasters. In the short term, they, they may also be a need to protect vulnerable groups from the adverse effects of a transition to low carbon development. It is estimated that about 40% of Egypt's employment share is concentrated in brown sectors, such as construction and transport, and 58% in yellow sectors, such as crops, as rice, for example. 
cities and countries can adapt and expand safety nets while investing in reskilling and supporting labor mobility. So if you're interested in more details, it's uh, a lot of research, very heavy, some of them, also very economics in many ways. Uh, please look out for the forthcoming report on Vibrant Cities, where I'm one of the co-authors, uh, with, together with several prominent World Bank colleagues. My colleagues, Somik Lau, Forhat Shubi, and Sally Murray are very prominent um, co-authors as well. So thank you very much. So let me get to something a little bit more, less, less heavy. And I want to make this as interactive as possible. Uh, this is a photo of uh, Aman. I was, just, uh, I was just there a few weeks ago. Um, and it's ongoing technical assistance. And we're doing operations in the greater Aman municipality. So in 2020, the mayor of Aman, this guy here, his name is uh, Dr. Yusuf Shawabe. Uh, approached the World Bank to seek technical and financial assistance to identify critical pathways to transform itself and to reach its vision of a smart, livable, and sustainable city, right? So, of course, I was there with a team and uh, not really sure how complicated the task was going to be. And um, I want to do something different today. So let's imagine you're a top-notch urban policy advisor to the city mayor. All of you graduated from the top-notch university in the world, ranked number eight in the world, first in Asia, known as National University of Singapore, all right? So I'm gonna show a few slides, and I would love to get volunteers, just first reactions, on two questions, right? What is one priority issue that needs action, and why? And the second is, how would you go about doing it, right? Not just conceptually, but specifically planning it, what needs to be done, how you're gonna finance it, and how you're gonna implement it. And you need to say this in just a couple of sentences, right? So just a few slides, and then I hope some of you will volunteer. So I'm doing this for the first time, not sure it will work. Some background, right? Three key characteristics that define cities in MENA, and Aman is no exception. First, cities in MENA are physically and economically fragmented. Horizontal expansion, such as sprawl and leapfrogging, makes cities very inefficient and costly, especially when it comes to infrastructure and service provision. And this is very typical of big cities in the MENA region. Second, MENA populations are not economically mobile. This means that labor markets and people are, are very stuck in place, making it difficult for firms to find people, skills, the job market, and vice versa. And then the third is that cities are not well connected to regional and global markets. What I mean is they're not like Singapore where you have a fantastic airport, seaport, you're connected to the rest of the world. In cities in MENA are very disconnected from the regional and global markets, right? Which creates lots of barriers for cities to export tradable services. And getting large cities right is really important in MENA. Jordan's population and economic activity is highly concentrated in Amman, uh, compared globally and to other MENA cities around the world. In fact, it holds, um, if you exclude the GCC countries, Jordan and Amman itself holds about 40% of its population in a capital city and provides 55% of its total employment or 70% of its GDP. That's very high. So everything in one basket. With a population of 4 million, the city also has become a beacon of stability, hosting hundreds and thousands of refugees. Uh, starting in the 1948s, when the first refugees from Palestine arrived, continuing with the Gulf War of the 2000s and later during the Syrian crisis starting in 2010. So lots of large refugee population. So with Amman having such an outside share of the economy and population, this has profound implications, right? If Amman can reap the dividends from inclusive growth and urbanization, it can benefit not just itself, but the whole country. On the flip side, if Amman doesn't get urban and urbanization right, it could become detrimental to the country's growth. So what do we do? 
Amman's population has quadrupled compared to 30 years ago, from 1 million in 1991 to 4 million in 2022, and is estimated to reach 4.8 million uh, by 2030. However, the accom accompanying spatial expansion of the city is characterized by fragmentation, as you see in this chart, this map. This has caused Amman to provide infrastructure and services at a pace, scale, and cost far greater than in the past. This is the land cover of Amman based on remote sensing work that was done in collaboration with the European Space Agency. What we did was we took high resolution imagery and we did pattern recognition and we were able to classify land use based on residential or commercial and so on and so forth. So the red areas demarket residential areas, which makes up most of Amman. Purple areas are commercial and magenta areas are industrial areas. What's really interesting to note is that at the periphery of urban areas are arable and cropland. These are the beige and orange colors, meaning that any expansion may grow into those areas. There's also a large swath of bare lands to the east of Amman. The urban morphology of Amman is generally very low rise. Historical buildings along hilly terrain with several areas to the east for refugee populations, and even though most refugees are in host communities. Right? Congestion, big problem. Access to affordable housing and public spaces, very limited. And the city suffers from flooding, from rain, which adds to congestion as well. There have been numerous efforts to improve city services, such as investments in um, the bus rapid transit or BRT system. This is phase one has been completed with mixed reviews by citizens. And phase two has been in the works for quite some time. Still planning for it, and they're looking to finance it. And one of the sources of financing they're asking is from the World Bank. Amman is ambitious. It's one of those few cities in MENA that wants to reach near zero emissions by 2050. And because urbanization is so concentrated in Amman, this also means that any action by the city can move the needle on the country's efforts to be more sustainable on the mitigation front. The large emitting sectors are mainly buildings, energy, transportation, and waste. So everything that has to do with cities and urban areas. Amman has developed a comprehensive climate action plan, but complementary measures are needed for reducing exposure to environmental hazards, improving water and energy efficiency, and upgrading waste management. Unfortunately, economic growth is flagging, or is, is not working. The private sector has struggled to create new and quality jobs, resulting in low firm entry levels relative to urbanization rates, even by MANA standards, which is already very low globally. So what these charts really show that as urbanization rate increases, meaning that as the country is more urbanized, typically you attract firms to come in and set up. So at a certain level, you get more firms per population, right? But in MENA countries, which is denoted in red, that has been very low. And for Jordan itself, it's even lower, right? Youth unemployment in Jordan is staggering, 46%. That's very high. And this is significantly above the region's already very high youth unemployment of 26%. And it is estimated in, that in MENA, in the next two decades, 300 young people like you will be joining the workforce, having high expectations for quality jobs and looking for good jobs. And 300 million people is the size of the US almost, right? That's a lot of people. So what Aman, how Amman positions itself within the region and the global landscape to attract new talent and to boost competitiveness has become even more critical. On finance, unfortunately, Amman is characterized by high levels of debt, inadequate revenues, and an uncertain road to recovery, which makes any investments in infrastructure and services very tight. While the economic recovery and efforts to broaden the tax base have continued to improve domestic revenue collection, Spending pressures from the reintroduction of policies such as fuel subsidies and other policies has exerted a lot of pressure on the fiscal deficit. So basically, no money to spend on services and infrastructure. Very difficult position. 
So in summary, Aman, eggs in one basket, growing population, high youth unemployment, spatial fragmentation, large investment needs, fiscal imbalance, lots of climate risk. But it wants to be carbon neutral by 2050. It has a high capacity municipality, good people, and it has a very charismatic mayor who has a four-year term. This is his second term. He wants to do something visionary. So what do we do? You meet the city manager to brief him on the way forward. So going back to the two questions, I just want to hear first reactions before I share with you some of the work we did on how we tried to create a strategy for transformation, right? So first question, identify one priority issue that needs an action, and how would you go about doing it? I would like to ask for volunteers. If not, I'll just point to someone and <laughs> you can respond. It doesn't have to be too fancy, your answers. You know, so raise your hands if anybody wants to say something. Any reactions? Yes, the lady behind. What's your name? Uh, sorry? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It matters. You are a top policy advisor to the mayor. He needs to know your name and what you have to say, right? Okay. Sure. Hi, my name is Bernice. Hi, Bernice. Hi. Are you a student? In many ways, yes. Okay. Uh, I, I teach here. Oh, you teach here, sorry. But I also learn from here. Okay. Uh, well, it sounds like one priority issue. Okay, this is just like, you know, out of my backside. Lah. So <laughs> one guess is, um, you mentioned fragmentation. Yes. It's a big problem. So uh, one of the things I do is network science. Uh, which is like, you know, you see the world in dots and lines. Okay. Uh, but it's, it's also very powerful. So, so one thing that it triggered me to think of is like um, making the city more connected in different okay. ways. Yeah. So it can be physically through transport, but, but a lot of um, linkages can also be made in economic and social ways. Yeah. So it's like literally connecting the dots. Okay. Yeah, that's a very good answer. So what you really mean is that improve connectivity, transportation, so that people will have better access to jobs as well as services in a city that's very fragmented because cost of travel is a big issue for people in Amman. The gentleman over there. Your name? Anuish. Hello. So actually the thing is, uh, as we have high population density at the center of the city, first we should uh, incentivize people to go outside, like create, uh, ask them uh, to buy lines outside, uh, which, which would be relatively cheaper. But uh, the point would be, as business areas and agriculture areas will be nearer to that, properly plan that areas uh, before they are shifted out. Shifted out means they should be incentivized to buy land over that region. Once there is migration internally from interior of the city to outside, then try to uh, network out the city from exterior to interior properly. Uh, so one, day, uh, one thing would be that outside cities would be start developing and uh, they, they could be in uh, better connectivity with outside world. Uh, so once we reduce uh, very he heavy urbanization in the center part of the city and th there is economic growth, uh, so now, when there is economic growth, it will lead to f better financing for the rest of the city. Then we can start a cyclic process. That may be an option. Okay, so we're, what you're really talking about, how, how to use land more efficiently. I'm not so sure about this locating people from their uh, homes elsewhere. No, uh, I'm not saying forceful uh, migration. I'm saying incentivizing I that. See. Okay, uh, so you're talking about plan, plan growth, plan expansion in rather the outside than outside growth. Which will incentivize them to go outside. Okay. Okay, so about peripheral expansion, plan growth rather than ad hoc growth, yeah. and how to you, uh, use land more efficiently uh, in the existing city center, something like that. Yes, so land use, there basically. is some economic prosperity in the outside region. And providing incentives for affordable housing, that's what you're getting at as well. No? Yes. Okay, good answer. Anyone else? No? 
Anybody wants to talk about the financial situation of Aman? How do we get out of that? Hello, hi, uh, I'm Darshan. Uh, so there are a lot of issues with uh, job uh, job provisions. And uh, as I noticed in the land use plan, the central region is completely residential. Uh, means highly focused on residential areas. So the idea is to promote small businesses uh, so that there is an economic cycle that starts generating uh, in the city. Uh, there was very less green areas in the center space also. Uh, so maybe uh, having more public domains, public spaces, more urban projects. Uh, once the economic cycle starts to run in the center, you will get, uh, the, the government will get money to start more and more infrastructural projects, maybe at a very small scale in the beginning and then expand it later on. And uh, I do not agree with his idea of creating stalls. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Uh, yeah, it's okay. but uh, so there can be like small steps uh, to densify the core region and agglomerate and uh, generate economic center in the, uh, in okay. the core area. So mixed use development, yeah. looking at agglomeration, promoting local economic development is important. Yeah. Growth, the growth story. I saw another hand. Okay, so my comment is more towards financial aspect of this thing. So I was just wondering, just like industries get their finance by raising money from public, can't there be some scheme where you can finance your uh, infrastructure by raising money from public as a share? So, so raising with, money from? Uh, let's say you are uh, in, in, in a certain area, you need a certain infrastructure like uh, a BRTS or an MRT yeah. system to be made in this city. So you can what you can do is that to finance that kind of project you can take part of uh, it from uh, international institutions and a part of it from uh, the residents who are going to benefit from uh, it nearby okay. so that way you will get the initial finance that can uh, yeah. start the cycle so that's that's a very good answer what, what you're talking about is uh, cost recovery mm -hmm. for urban services yeah, something like a better means as well as uh, something we call land value capture land based financing because if you invest in infrastructure, land values increase, and the city should have a fair share of yeah. uh, land value increases. And that is through things like taxes and property taxes. And, yeah, and so the uh, infrastructure that is, being, uh, that is to be improved needs to be cho uh, chosen really wisely, because if one of the project is uh, successful, uh, it is easier to do the next project. Because of, uh, so earning the confidence. trust of citizens, doing things that are visible. Yeah, so trust is something uh, that well. needs to be started. Great. I feel like you've answered everything. I don't have to present anymore. <laughs> Wonderful. Anybody wants to say anything before I move on? It would be like cooperative funding. So uh, government will say, uh, we are a company. Uh, uh, investors would be the people itself. And uh, they would be like, we will have a, a profit share in uh, what you get in return. Okay, so private sector participation. Okay, wonderful. So the first thing we did was to really look at some of the problems that are facing in terms of cost, right? The, what my team did was we started to think about scenarios. In fact, we did four different scenarios. The first scenario is business as usual, the bar on the left. So the top uh, chart is basically cost. Costs, investment costs, and land consumption scenario. Land consumption at the, at the bottom, right? So the green areas are additional land take. What does it mean spatially? What does it mean in terms of cost? Business as usual is that there are no master plans, no policies to control growth. What happens? We were actually able to model that. Uh, and what that means is increased costs in infrastructure a lot, right? By 2050, you're looking at almost $10 billion uh, based on the model. Models are always wrong, but I'm just saying what came out of this model. And um, The second scenario we looked at is what happens today, plan 2050, based on today's master plan. You know, Aman has effectively reduced infrastructure costs by a, a good percentage and also reduced land take. But they also have a more ambitious plan, which they haven't implemented. But if they were to implement it with uh, more integration with different sectors as well as more stringent uh, growth, and better land use, they were able to reduce land use by quite a bit. 
um, and also reduce infrastructure costs by quite a lot as well, another 25%. What I didn't show is the O&M costs, operations costs, that also reduces. So it's a very straightforward thing. Integration spatially and sectorally makes a lot of sense economically as well. But AMA wants to be net zero by 2050, and that cost is going to be a lot. And that's because of investments in renewable energy, right? So, so that's something that we did. Um, and and, and the, the three critical questions now is how can Aman be more integrated spatially and across key sectors? And how do we reach its 2050 goals, right? And it's a dis decision point, where do you want to go? So that was the first thing um, uh, uh, that we did. And we see that, that Aman is at a stage where sectoral policies alone will only have so much impact. It is necessary now to influence urban planning and spatial form in a way that creates synergies and integrate sector solutions that has a compounding effect. In fact, spatial planning and urban development is one of the least cost pathways towards lower emissions and infrastructure cost reduction. And the returns of investments can outweigh the upfront costs. And I'll give you an example. For instance, Aman is very serious about investing in the second phase of public transportation with a new BRT system. So this would be the lines to the east of Aman. A lot of these have not been implemented. It's going to do a second phase. Um, but we realized that the moment you have a BRT, this is some modeling that we did. Uh, there will be some areas that the projected land use needs or the projected floor area needs exceeds the current zoning. These are the darker areas, right? Because when you improve connectivity, that changes the dynamics of people. People move and firms decide to relocate. And we show what happens when the new BRT system is in place, right? And on the right, uh, we show what happens when the new BRT system in, is in place, and if you also work on land use, what happens? The productivity for the city increased in the manufacturing and services sectors by more than 7%, keeping population constant, right? So that's a, a big thing. But this can only happen when you integrate two sectors together, land use and transportation, you need to do it in an integrated way. Aman's urban planning legislative framework has also been a big barrier to the city's ability to conduct comprehensive planning and to reap the benefits from land value capture. We spoke about land value capture, right? So we were asked to review their planning legislation and we discovered that Aman faced difficulties in even collecting simple things like development levies from developers. They get challenged in the court of law because the planning law is weak and, and they lose, basically because their planning law doesn't have the robustness or the strength for Aman to use them effectively. So we think that modernizing the planning laws would, be, would bring about profound changes on how urban planning can be more effectively used. And it needs to be able to do four things. First is to unlock effective use of land value capture instruments. It needs to be able to strengthen the planning processes and mechanisms. And it needs to improve public participation and safeguards, and also strengthen institutions and governance. Uh, legislative reforms are only as effective as it's accompanied by other non-legislative uh, reforms. So these are the things after our review that GAM needs to do in terms of legislation. But they also need to do it in conjunction with the national government, because this legislation of the law is also a national uh, national, uh, it has linkages to the national laws, right? And some of the zoning laws are as old as 1966, so very outdated. At the same time, GAM and AMA needs to also support some of these legislative reforms with improvements in land information systems, accounting collection, capacity building, and so on and so forth. So we've done a lot of work on this to identify what are the critical process for reforms, basically. And modernizing land urban planning is broadly is also seen as a means to help solve the, unaffor the affordable housing challenges in Aman. Aman's housing market is not as efficient, nor is it responsive as should be with very high vacancy rates, as seen in this chart. 
Another opportunity that Aman can fully utilize is its power to shape good urbanization for the city. Using its three powers that it has, right, to strengthen urban planning, legislation, and fiscal instruments are just two ways of how GAN can unlock land-based financing. So when we talk about powers within the municipality, typically, you know, you have powers to regulate land. Uh, you have powers to also mandate taxes and fees, fiscal instruments, which is also a government, national government's mandate. But the last is also, Aman has lots of government-owned land and property that needs to be leveraged on. We did a global survey of all the land-based financing instruments there are, or the land value capture instruments there are. Uh, and these are just a list of some of these instruments that Aman can look to, to unlock, so that they are able to reap a fair share of uh, land value increases uh, to finance further investments in services and infrastructure. Uh, Aman does quite well in property taxes, but they have areas because COVID-19 has put a lot of people into uh, poor situations, so they sometimes write off a lot of these. So they actually lose a lot of money, and I think they can strengthen some of these land-based financing instruments um, as part of the planning review. A lot of these have linkages to asset management, uh, linkages to urban planning, and link linkages to municipal finance. So this is a map of all the municipal lands that uh, Aman has, which is under leverage. Um, a total of book value of Jordanian dinars, 2.4 billion, that's about 3.6 billion in US dollars that has not been used, right? Um, and I talked about the new BRT. So the moment the BRT comes in, a lot of these lands are close to or close by to this new uh, transport uh, alignment and land values are going to change. So how do you leverage true land-based financing? We did a calculation for back of envelope calculation for Aman and it, it turned out that if you're able to capitalize on some of these lands, uh, you could potentially have increased revenues of up to 100 million Jordanian dinners uh, per year, which is almost 50% of all the revenues that the city collects um, uh, in a year. So, so a big opportunity to use land more efficiently in Amman. And this is hidden assets that often a lot of cities do not know. A lot of cities I work with, I ask them, how much land do you own and how much property? Nobody knows. And I think the first thing that local governments should do is often to look at the assets they have and to use them very wisely. Um, private sector participation is also key to achieving Amman's growth and climate goals. And the International Finance Corporation, IFC, estimates that the climate investment opportunity in Amman is about $12 billion, most of which resides in sectors such as transportation, electrification of vehicles, and water and waste management, uh, and green buildings, of course. So urban planning has a, a big role to play in prioritizing key infrastructure, uh, such as roads and public transport facilities and how planning instruments can work with developers or energy companies to play a role in rejuvenating a green building program, for instance. Some of these sectors are more ready than others. In some sectors, like solid waste management, significant operational inefficiencies result in higher than average costs needs to be addressed before Aman can take advantage of private sector. So lots of opportunity for the private sector to come in to be part of that growth story. Many of the solutions also require heavy upfront investments, uh, be it capital investments or reforms. But nonetheless, there are some short-term, low-cost, high-impact opportunities that Aman can embark on, including greening Aman. We spoke about having a four-year term. The mayor needs something visible. Someone said, right, we need something visible to earn the trust of citizens. Uh, and this could be one of them public spaces and greenery. In fact, in, in collaboration with the European Space Agency, the World Bank developed a new data layer looking at uh, using remote sensing and high resolution satellite imagery to map out the green spaces and different densities across different categories. So on the left, you see the distribution of green areas in Amman. And the right is the excess or the amount of green space that are within walking distance. So you can see that's a big divide 
And in Amman, if you know Amman very well, the east of Amman is the poorer parts of the city. Uh, there are several refugee camps there. And then to the west is more. So really an opportunity to think about with the new BRT also doing urban regeneration in new areas and greening Amman, right? That, that was something we're looking into. Um, access to services not well distributed in Amman. Uh, we analyze education, healthcare, and public services spaces. And in Amman, less than half the population are within walking distance 20 minutes from these amenities. This is an interesting piece of analytical work we conducted with the Microsoft Artificial Intelligence for Good Research Lab, where we use high resolution imagery to I try to, to identify areas with poor urban environments. So we took different maps in different times, we tagged them with ground truthing, and then we run through machine learning and we were able to do it in a very quick way. Where are these areas? And we see them uh, to also to the certain parts of Amman around um, refuge, refugee camps which are demarcated in, in blue. So, you know, doing, using analytics like that also helped the city to identify the city has very limited resources, so it needs to prioritize where it wants to improve, where the vulnerable people are, and some of these would help in, in doing that. Uh, Nature-based solutions can help protect assets and integrate urban resilience and improve livability. In a study that we did, uh, it shows that about 70,000 households in Amman will be exposed to pluvial flooding. 50% of them would be low income and would find it very hard to recover from damages. Um, greenery could help mitigate extreme heat islands in the city, um, and heat islands from climate change could threaten urban health and productivity. All right, again, using maps, being able to prioritize areas that need some of this intervention the most uh, was something quite critical. And to use that money, uh, funding, and investments in a very strategic way is, is highly important. Finally, strong governance and accountability are becoming increasingly relevant in MENA with several cities, including Amman, using new delicated models of service delivery and municipal land development. Amman's governance structure is a political hybrid, part elected, part appointed, with strong accountability to citizens. So we want to also leverage on that, building on the strong accountability practices. Several cities uh, are using, as I mentioned, delegated models of service delivery through municipal companies, professionalizing them. Uh, and one example is Moroccan cities, which rely on these service providers um, quite extensively. Amman has started to professionalize this public sector through setting up of municipal companies such as the Amman Vision Investment and Development Company. And Avid and its subsidiaries are now involved in developing public lands for services and investment running services such as solid waste management and public transportation. However, Aman and Avid would need to strengthen their governance and accountability structures in managing public land and assets and enhance horizontal coordination in urban planning uh, to fully leverage on such a model. So having some of these private companies can help professionalize uh, municipal capacity as well. Right. So, if I had three messages for how a city like Amman can transform, I would focus on the following. First, Amman is at a stage where sector-specific solutions can only do so much. We need to think spatially and to find ways to create synergies uh, that will have a compounding effect. Second, Amman has limited resources and a small window to act. So it needs to prioritize. The first is really taking on critical foundational reforms like urban planning investments, both critical infrastructure like connectivity, as well as low-cost, high-impact ones that you can undertake now, like greening, working with private sector on inclusive growth. And lastly, it needs to look towards maximizing and leveraging public assets that it already has, like public land and developing new land-based financing models and land value capture models. To conclude, the World Bank is working with Aman in several technical areas, We're working with Aman on trying to improve credit worthiness and improving financial management of the municipality. We are giving technical assistance to public land and asset management. We're working with them to transform and modernize their urban planning legislation. And we're 
in the process of developing a possible pipeline investment, meaning a loan that we give the city uh, on implementing its connectivity BRT as well as neighborhood regeneration in certain locations. We're also giving technical assistance on municipal spatial data infrastructure and capacity building to use data more effectively for policy making. So that's where we are. I think it's an exciting work. Look out for you know, where this goes in, in a year's time when we're able to show some tangible results. But it's been a very exciting journey, especially for my team and I. And uh, I would be happy to be back next year to show you what we have achieved. So with that, let me thank you for your patience. I hope that was useful, and, uh, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hello. Thank you, Mr. John, for that very interesting lecture. I would now like to introduce the moderator of the evening, Dr. Darren Nell. Dr. Darren is a postdoc fellow at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy as well as NUS Cities. His current research focuses on advancing the integration of complexity science into policy and governance. His research also extends into the realms of urban resilience, urban morphology, and the dynamic spatial temporal interplay in urban policy, planning, and design. Darren's work aims to contribute to the development of more resilient, inclusive, and sustainable urban environments. Prior to earning his PhD in Resilient Urban Design from the School of Design at the Hong Kong Polytechnic University, Darren gained practical experience as an urban planner and spatial analyst. His professional journey led him through a range of diverse projects in South Africa, Kenya, India, and China. His extensive exposure ex equipped him with an appreciation of the challenges and opportunities that cities face across various contexts. Please join me in welcoming him on stage. We now invite the audience in the auditorium as well as on Zoom to raise their questions. Thanks, Sanjana. Right. Uh, thank you so much for the really informative talk, and I think you've you've really highlighted the the importance of planning, governance, and taking a spatial lens through all of this. And I think it's. I have an urban planning background. I re it really resonates with a lot of what I've seen and experienced as well. Um, I think I want to start by opening up the, the, the questions to the crowd before I get to my own questions. So is there anyone here who has any questions that they'd like to ask? No one? Okay. Okay, we have one here. And then at the back there. I have a question regarding how um, the World Bank, I mean, in this particular context, um, look at these. Um, I would say, under the under the radar layers of um, tribal relationships, land ownership, potential corruption, these kind of things. How does it come into play when you? look at these recommendations and plans? And if you could share some of your insight. To sure, sure. Well, that's, a, that's a very good question. Um, so in, in a lot of work that we do, once we, we have a formal request for assistance for a particular um, uh, project or program, uh, we often do a, a political economy assessment as well, trying to understand the dynamics of not just land, but structures, social structures, and so on and so forth. And we do have, um, so I'm an urban specialist, but usually in a big team, when we start preparing a project or program, we also have social development specialists with us who will be more attuned to some of these uh, dynamics. Um, that, that's one part. And the second part is that in, um, in, in, uh, in any World Bank program or project, we often have safeguards in place, social environment safeguards. Uh, and um, uh, you know, e even in procurement to ensure that a lot of this financing goes to the right purposes. Uh, corruption is, you know, we, we, we do uh, audits and checks uh, quite often and it's part of the processes. Um, I'm, so, so I, I, yeah. So, so that that's always a key con consideration, right? 
the, that, that's something that we do all the time. In fact, I, don't, I didn't talk about it, but everything that we do has always a political dimension to it. Uh, whether it's the mayor's term and he, he needs something now and he wants to do it, whether it's, uh, you know, is it going to change the social dynamics or something, it's, it's something that we, we think about quite, quite often in, in almost all the programs and projects we, we do. Right. Did I answer your question? Okay. So basically, yes. Before I, I jump to the next question, I actually wanted to ask you a bit on the, that issue of the tribal powers because I, I've seen in South Africa, for example, the tribal authorities have tremendous power and influence over what happens where local governments develop plans, but they're unable to implement it because of the tribal authorities you know, blocking it or saying we, we want to use the funds differently. So how do you navigate that type of situation? Stakeholder consultation is call to every activity that, that we do. And we will often get a sense of who this, where the power structures are and to make sure that there is buy-in in many of the things we do before we proceed with it. So we do identify this risk. Um, sometimes it's about getting them involved. I remember uh, in a very difficult project in Karachi, I, I led the first World Bank operation in the city of Karachi. Again, it's a city transformation uh, work. We, we, were, we were not um, able to, uh, there was no World Bank activity for more than a decade in the city of Karachi. And if you know Karachi in Pakistan well, uh, I think many years ago, the national government, the uh, provincial government, and the city government were all from different political parties. So it was really difficult to get this project going because every uh, stakeholder would want to have a different way of doing it and they want ownership as well. So when we did neighborhood upgrading in the city of Karachi, we said, okay, why don't we identify three critical neighborhoods that some of these were had, uh, they were more aligned to different uh, power holders. So everyone had a share, right? And it was the first time in a very long time that when we had the launch of this project that you see the city mayor next to the provincial governor, which never happens, and, and the World Bank, and we were quite proud of that piece of work. So trying to understand this dynamics is very important in the program of project design as well, making sure that everyone has a piece of uh, the pie and making sure that coordination and platforms to allow for these to happen is, is important. There was a question at the back. Uh, yeah, you can just stand up and speak. Okay. Uh, introduce yourself as well, please. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kao, for your very interesting talk. And I am. Uh, so when you mentioned this project about Aman, you mentioned that actually there are many aspects of this city that needs to be improved in terms of economic development or reduce the vulnerability of some poorer com communities. Um, so my question is that. When a city does have this amount of money, or when World Bank can just lend this amount of money, which part would you uh, promote? Like either economic development or the social equity side. I feel that sometimes they are a bit contradict to each other. And actually, I read uh, an article there by a few community. Uh, economists in World Bank, and they, they are building a well-being loss model, uh, talking about uh, that they have res resilience uh, oh, policy intervention should focus on well-being instead of economic loss. So I think it makes sense, but in other way, uh, redu uh, focusing on economic loss can actually uh, reduce the, you know, after uh, post-disaster reconstructions uh, expense from the government. So I'm, I would like to know uh, your opinion on this. Yeah, so we, we do all of the above, right? We focus on growth, we focus on equity, and we often work with governments to decide on a priority. So in some cases, uh, certain priority takes uh, precedence. And depending on um, what we decide with different governments, 
we, we prioritize different projects. And we don't just do one project in one country. We do several projects in one country. Sometimes it's on city growth. Sometimes it's on doing business. Sometimes it's about uh, lagging regions where we support poverty and slums. And they hop, often, hop, often happen at the, the same time. But the primary objective of financing from the World Bank even though it's concessionary, is that we invest this into development objectives, right? Not everything. We're not going to invest in, say, a fancy new uh, city for the rich, but really about how do you uh, protect uh, the poor or the vulnerable people. That, that's often the most important, hence the mission that I stated at the beginning of our talk. So uh, we do prioritize and we work with country governments on the country partnership framework on what would be the key priorities for the country. In Jordan, for example, when we did the something we called the Climate uh, Country Development Report, some of the key issues that came up top was actually the water issue and agriculture issue. Because water is so scarce and Amman is getting worse, you really need to invest in how to you, uh, use water more sustainably uh, as well as food production, even more so than the cities, the city agenda that I just spoke about, right? So we, we do this very comprehensive assessment countrywide uh, on what are the key priorities, and we decide where we want to put our money, which will have the best impact and the most important impact for the country. Any other questions from the crowd? Um, okay, there's, uh, there's a lady over here. Um, okay. Hi, uh, my name is Vivian Pan. I'm from C40 City. So, um, yes. with a C40. climate organization, <laughs> so Amman is one of the C40 yes. cities. So, yeah, thank you so much for your talk. I have two questions. Yes. Uh, so, I really kind of relate and echo with some of the recommendations that you, you provided, kind of a lesson learned for other cities as well and country. Our experience kind of working with cities, like and kind of moving, kind of like promote quite heavily on kind of like mitigation strategy. And then it's really our effort also to try to incorporate urban planning in it. I think to, one of the question is that in terms of modeling, because like you're showing kind of the, the model to incorporate urban planning with some of the mitigation strategy, like expansion of like mass public transport, like in terms of how much is those study cost, for example, like for a city that is like want to do kind of so like have evidence-based study, right? So we don't have, not all the city have cal cal like in the fourth having yeah. World Bank come in and do the study for yeah. them. So how much does it cost um, so that they can kind of like make the case, a business case for that? That's the first question. And also kind of like the second question is kind of alluded a little bit in terms of kind of the um, the willingness for the city administration to take on kind of like a land use reform because it does, it's like a long-term project yeah, in the yeah. regions. And there's oftentimes like they are bounded, the mayor are bounded by their kind of the terms that they, they in office. They're <coughs> unlikely to take on a really long-term project if they're not confident that they're going to yeah, be yeah. in the office. So how do you, or what are your recommendations kind of like ensuring those smaller steps that we kind of start to do, kind of like greening in certain part of the areas, all those steps can contribute to a larger plan, like overall, like to move forward instead of like a really segmented kind of like plans that at the end not contribute to the greater good of the city. Yeah. In the long term. Okay. So your first question is on uh, the cost of doing some of this modeling work. Uh, the second question is how do you convince governments to take on uh, difficult reforms, basically, yeah. right? So th the first question is easy. It's it's not expensive. It's easy. I think the question is. In the urban sector, it's, it's harder to find a, a readily accepted model. Like C40 has a way of doing your inventory for carbon. You don't take into account the spatial dimension of it, right? Yeah. So, so that's one thing. But you are have quite uh, renowned in terms of you have many cities that often refer to your database for emissions. Uh, we did this because we thought the spatial dimension is an important factor for Emissions. So if you don't bring in the spatial factor, then you're only looking at sectoral solutions, which are difficult to do because, sure, you can work on green buildings, but if you don't control growth, you're going to have more green buildings. And even though they're green, they still take up more energy, you know? So that was the effort. And the cost of this was not expensive. I would say it's less than 100K if you have the data. Most cities do not have data. And now we have very advanced systems of uh, doing uh, land use. You don't really need fancy GIS systems. You can use satellite imagery, remote sensing, which is pretty accurate, uh, especially in places that don't have too much leaf cover foliage. 
might be difficult in Singapore because everything is just green. You think it's green. Uh, but in places like Amman, it's easy to pick up, which is residential, which is uh, potential slums, which are commercial areas, and, and so on and so forth, right? You can actually then make informed calculations. We even use things like uh, cell phone data to show where people go to work. So we can actually estimate which are work locations, which are residential locations. So I think the, the use of technology is so amazing today that cities that didn't have data before can leapfrog with new information to do policy making. And I think that's, that's becoming more affordable, cheaper as we go. And uh, you know, that's open source data that's becoming more available. And the second question, reforms. It's really a lot of conversation, evidence, um, uh, even working with the city mayor to pitch some of these ideas at the national level. Because not everyone sees the linkages between doing, say, reforms on one area, how it impacts the rest. I think that's where the World Bank does quite well, is that we pr produce a lot of analytical public goods that can inform, make information useful to people to make good decisions, right? So I, I showed you that if you invest in BRT system alone, without doing much, you're not going to reap the full rewards of uh, of productivity. But if you do it together with land use reforms, the city can achieve 7% growth in the manufacturing and services sectors, which is a lot, but you need to do it together, right? Land use and transportation. So the government is now very receptive. They are looking at ideas on how we can combine land use and transport infrastructure. Previously, it was just infrastructure. Let's just build more roads and, you know, and BRT alone. But now they're thinking of this sort of issues as well. A lot of conversation. I, and you know, the easiest way for me is usually the first thing I do when I come to a city is to identify who the champion is. In this case, the mayor was a very charismatic person, action-oriented, uh, able to do things brave enough to make difficult decisions, and that's important. In other cities, other areas, maybe not. It could be someone else. It could be the governor. So that, that's also a, a very important, who is the who is going to take the action is, is, is very important, as in addition to being convincing with, with data, right? Good. Uh, there is another question. Uh, yes. Uh, so, question is, uh, like, uh, with the modernization of IT, uh, like, how much impactful it would be to, read, for example, Singapore got from a slum to a developed nation in, let's say, 30, 40 years, okay? Then, uh, then uh, what is the probability that uh, using of more IT technologies, the development, number of development years would come from 30 to 20, 25, something like that. And like IT is much, uh, IT infrastructure is uh, much quicker uh, in sense of results. Like, but developing that physical infrastructure takes lots of time. Then what are your uh, views? How, how do we reduce this physical, uh, developing physical infrastructure time? Like, for example, uh, to get a, a metro into Jordan would at least take 10 to 15 years of uh, only construction time. Then how do you reduce this time in, in urban scenarios? So, sorry, so how do you reduce? This uh, construction, uh, too much uh, physical infrastructure takes lots of time to get fully yes, developed. Yes. How do you reduce this uh, physical infrastructure development time? That would be like very important to get the things done to get the economy moving, everything moving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we always say that you need to do a lot of, uh, we advocate for planned growth, infrastructure planning, infrastructure ahead of time. Uh, right? Singapore does that very well. So you try to prevent uh, sort of build, dig and then rebuild again type of scenarios, which happens a lot. I think that w that's the, the biggest problem. Um, and, and really trying to think ahead of time on anticipating growth and where growth is going to happen is, is important for cities in terms of infrastructure as well. Uh, in terms of reducing infrastructure time to, to build, um, I, I guess technology, I don't, I, I, I don't know. But uh, you know, one reason we face uh, delays in infrastructure development is that there's often in my experience, it's not so much about technology or whether how fast you can build infrastructure. Is how do you sustain the policy going forward? There's so many cities around the world where the moment the government changed, 
the infrastructure you build is just left to, uh, to, to not happen, right? And the, the pylons stay there for another decade before a new government comes in and then continues or it gets demolished. Uh, I think sustaining that policy beyond the tenure of the mayor, beyond the tenure of the minister is highly important. And that's something we don't see too often in uh, many, many countries we, we work, work on. So, and that, that's a very difficult question. I, I mean, uh, just, just yeah. adding to it. Uh, but thing is, uh, as you said, the uh, city is itself in debt. Now, how, how will they foresee something or able to do for the future if they are not able to like finance for their current needs also? Then how do you say that uh, you should plan for the future so that uh, everything is good and before time, but they don't have even money to finance their present. Yeah, but, but you, you can't. You can't say let's work on this and finish it before we look to the future, right? You often have to do things concurrently, right? So, uh, you know, for example, municipal finance, Aman is struggling with how do you think about that? And even though credit worthiness is so far away because the financial systems are not working well, but they still need to think about it. They are thinking about it and they, they want to achieve it. And it doesn't start when they finish what they can do now, but they are starting to think about how they can become credit worthy now. Right, so it's not just about financing today's needs, but it's also planning for tomorrow's needs. And when you do budgeting, for example, it's not a one-year cycle; you do it for a five-year cycle, and, and and so on and so forth. Um, you know, I, I I think things have to happen concurrently, uh, and uh, that's the way things work. You always have too much problems for you to solve. You need to prioritize. You need to know your trade-offs. Uh, uh, you know, for example, COVID. Right, a lot of governments decide to forgive arrears or not collect taxes or, you know, or, or give fewer subsidies, or whatever. Right, not collect traffic fines, and that has an impact on government financing. But they had to do it because of the situation at hand. Right now, on the road to recovery, what do you do to improve that? To and sometimes to even collect more revenues, you need to also show that things work. So it's really a fine balance. It's an art, basically, on how do you show things can happen incrementally, but also thinking long-term uh, as you go forward and trying to solve multiple problems at once. That's the job of city leaders, unfortunately. Yeah, I really think infrastructure investment planning and management is undervalued in a lot of places. Yeah. And especially when it comes to things like infrastructure renewal and maintenance, that often, you know, it's easy to put things in, but it's really difficult to plan and maintain them. So how does the World Bank start promoting that or does it promote that within the, the planning? We do. I mean, in some sometimes, so the, the, the bad news is that often our project cycle is what, five to seven years maybe. So uh, what goes beyond that is hard to monitor, or, you know, because we don't give financing beyond that. Um, and, uh, but we do insist on the ONM quite, uh, quite strongly. Every, um, at least the, the ones that I worked on, every investments in infrastructure always have to come with good capacity to, for maintenance, whether it's through the budgeting cycle or having capacity built for asset management and so on and so forth. It's something we care about. Uh, but whether that sustains, it's really a question of whether the government takes ownership and brings it, institutionalize it uh, as part of uh, the government. It's, it's becoming quite important, yes. And sometimes we do insist or we put incentives for, for local governments or national governments to, to institutionalize some of these uh, practices as part of their, uh, uh, as, as a model, basically. Like in Egypt, where I'm leading the work, it's a flagship project, by the way, where we're decentralizing capacity to local governments to take on ownership of uh, doing things, being responsive, and they're doing a great job. And I have full confidence that even the, after the project, the program closes next year, they're going to continue. It's a lot of signs of doing that, and then they're scaling up to national uh, level as well. So some of these do happen, but a lot of them do not happen as well. And then we have another one there and then at the back. Okay, thank you. Um, I have one question about the carbon emissions. When you heard uh, they want to achieve the near near zero carbon by 2050, do you think this is the right objective? Because they have so many things to do. We are talking about infrastructure, yeah. uh, the investment on this, and that, all the carbon emissions. So you also mentioned that being resilient could cause higher carbon emissions, yes. right? So yes. which part is more important? And 
that you think about, okay, tell them, okay, forget about carbon emission, you need more carbon emission. <laughs> yeah. No, we don't. We don't. Uh -huh. we, we want them to work on carbon. And I think the lady next to you from C40 has a better answer because they have been struggling with trying to implement their uh, climate action plan for the longest time and C40 is helping them. Uh, very difficult. Uh, so the, the chart that I show, right, high cost, but 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 you could think of it two ways, right? One is, is really unachievable. But that's if you assume that the, the government does everything on its own, right? Half of it was the energy sector, which has lots of private sector involved. Why don't you leverage on them? You have to think of new financing models. And that's where we're pushing the boundaries of, of, um, of who takes action. It's not just governments that has to take action, but also stakeholders, private sector, and how do you create incentives or models, lower entry barriers for, say, green buildings? It's, it's really important. And identifying where it moves the needle. Buildings is one of the biggest, one of the biggest sectors. Transportation as well. So electric vehicle, electrification is going to make a big difference. And our transport colleagues are working very hard to think about models to allow uptake. So, and, the, and also another question I will ask is between adaptation and mitigation, which do you prioritize? We are in the Middle East. Can you imagine in a few years' time, it's going to be hot as anything, and uh, it's going to be floods and climate. Cities are going to be you know, inundated with sea level rises, especially in places like Egypt uh, and so, so on and so forth. So in the Middle East, any city will tell you that their first priority is always adaptation, because that's going to be front and foremost. But then in reality, when you think about solutions, they don't just do adaptation. You have to think adaptation and mitigation at the same time because they have co-benefits. And sometimes any solution has, has both, right? Planting more trees and having nature-based solutions both has an adaptative quality to it, but it also does mitigation. I think trying to think about these things do, ma do matter. I mean, I applaud Aman for even taking on the net zero energy because in reality, Aman and Jordan doesn't even emit as much GHG as, say, Saudi Arabia, for instance, which is the big elephant in the room. Um, but they're doing it anyway. And I think the only way that we're going to meet any, uh, you know, limit the rise in temperature is that all everybody has to take on and becomes a, a sort of a, a, a must, that you must have this uh, target, you know. And uh, not, not many cities in Manor have that target because they're still very oil-based, for instance. Uh, and they don't want to declare that they are want to go and see. So, so, so that's my take on it. Uh, I have a question. Just to want to draw your context from just how you mentioned. Uh, you know, uh, when the countries you, the initial plan, you already have the infrastructures in the stage. Your funding will be all kept to the different priorities. But, you know, throughout the periods, your geopolitical positions or your government power will change. So is there any existing strategy that uh, the World Bank actually has been considered or, or you have encountered this kind of situation and that is, uh, you know, you will reassess the whole situation and reprioritize your fund accordingly or uh, there's uh, something... Uh, in, uh, in place? Yes, we continue to renew our country partnership framework to uh, address the, the current government's needs. So it, it gets renewed uh, every uh, few years, three, three to five years, I think. Um, and uh, every time priorities do change. And that's the way, that's a mechanism for us to also respond to different uh, needs of, of, of the, the current government. Uh, so maybe some previous government may want to focus on different sectors while the new government thinks that, you know, uh, other sectors could be more important. And we work with them in partnership to determine some of these priorities uh, before we even start the process of uh, preparing a project or program to support some of the development needs. So in some sense, we do review. Uh, for ongoing projects, typically we don't. Sometimes we do restructure programs and projects. Uh, on, on, on certain occasions when things change. Uh, for instance, if uh, they introduce new laws that impact uh, 
the progress of achievement of some <coughs> objectives of this program, then we have to reassess, we do a restructuring of that pro of the loan to address the, the changes. Sometimes we do cancel projects because of things like corruption or misprocurement, uh, but that's a far, far in between. Uh, and um, yeah, we do, we do respond and react to different situations. Hi, uh, hi, my name is Sean. Uh, I'm from Zeroth Labs, so like a small research company. So my question is, uh, considering the stochastic nature of uh, urban challenges, like many that you showed us in one of the first few slides, such as housing markets, population movement, economic fragmentation, have spatial agent-based models. You didn't mention the, the, the term agent-based models, but I'm curious whether you guys have used it. ABM has been used as a tool to simulate and understand the dynamics at play. Um, could they help in identifying effective policy interventions by capturing the interactions and behaviors of diverse agents within the urban environment? Yes, in fact, we do agent-based modeling. In fact, the work with uh, European Space Agency is not out yet, so I can't share any details. We use agent-based modeling to show decisions made on urban growth, where they would build and not. We wanted to test the hypothesis of whether or not we could have policies that have people avoid risky areas and, and so on and so forth. But I, I have to say, right, using models in one thing, who was that famous guy who said that all models are wrong, so don't believe them, but some models are useful. So that, would, that is how I would take it. I use a lot of different tools at your disposal, but ultimately you need to discuss this, you need to have some sense, reality check as well, uh, before you apply it to policy making. Yeah, I think using like agent-based models for policy decisions is, on the one hand, is very useful for you to explore different options and possibilities, but there is risk in terms of the validity of the model, how do you validate that, and how do you get buy-in from politicians about the model who don't always understand yeah. so How have you kind of dealt with those type of challenges in terms of validity and buy-in in some of the modeling that you've done? Right, right. So I'm not an economist, but there are really top-notch economists at the World Bank that we rely on for peer reviews of some of these uh, models that we use. In fact, the one that we did on productivity and BRT was developed by a, a really famous uh, professor who's quite accepted in the field of uh, what they call a spatial CGE model. I can't even remember what it's called. Computational general equilibrium models that is often used. Um, it, it gives you a sense, but you need to really also be on the ground to, to feel, I, I feel. Uh, and I wouldn't be making those recommendations if I did not give, get a sense of it. You know, investing in connectivity would be would be important, right? Yeah. So, on the the, the point of connectivity, um, so I've got a lot of interest in urban form and urban morphology. So I was quite quite happy to see a lot of the spatial mapping. Did you, you know, man, evaluate how the urban form impacts uh, different qualities, uh, like the streets network structure? I think that'll have a big impact on how people move and access different opportunities. Did you do any evaluation on those type of aspects? How street patterns impact? Yeah, so uh, it's not just the public transport, but yeah. I mean, your, the structure of the streets in relation to the terrain will really impact how people can move and access opportunities. Did you do any evaluation of those type of aspects? Uh, we, we didn't go down to the typology of streets because, you know, it's Amman is dense already. I'm not sure we can have any room to change the street morphology. But we looked at, um, we had, I had a colleague who is in the transport sector who did uh, a more detailed assessment on uh, the impact on uh, streets and public transport to jobs, um, uh, to jobs. So I, I haven't read that. Uh, so I have a few more questions about this. Uh, well, <laughs> sure, sure, well, please go ahead. <laughs> have, the, have the opportunity. One of the, the things that I was busy reading the report a bit this afternoon, so I could prepare a bit. And one of the things that the report was talking about is the importance of land use planning, which I totally agree with, but the issues of zoning. And zoning is becoming under, uh, getting more and more criticism recently. Yeah. Um, and I see you, you mentioned in your 
presentation about Amman where they have to relook at reform their zoning policy, which is a bit restrictive. So how do we, because zoning is, is quite cumbersome, it can be very restrictive in many ways, and it, it's not so flexible. So how do you, what do you think we should be doing instead of zoning? Is, is zoning the right way to go forward in terms of planning? Because there is value in, in some type of restrictions or management, land use management, but how do we, we then start getting more flexible or adaptive land use management mechanisms? Because we still need to govern, govern this. Yeah, yeah. You know, and this whole idea of zoning is is is, is uh, interesting topic, right? It's been debated um, for a very long time. But on one hand, there are economists who say that zoning is uh, despotive um, and things should be market led and less affair. Uh, and then because planners don't have a real say in the physical environment, uh, I'm somewhere in between, right? I I believe that zoning needs to be responsive to the short-term market demands as well as the long-term needs for, for uh, the country. And I think in the point was that a lot of places, people do not trust the information that's being put out to them, whether it's land zoning. So it's difficult for private actors, such as developers or even you know, residents to make decisions on where they want to locate or live. Uh, so the importance of good information, such as zoning, has to be there. So that, that was the point of the, the report. Yeah. So it's a lot more about trust and in a way creating some form of certainty or- On information. Like, yeah, on yes. information yes. that's around. I, I agree with that completely. Something else I was also being wondering about is in your, your first part, you were talking about this vibrancy and you, there's three elements to it, which was resilience, inclusive and productive. So I think one thing that there, there's certain trade-offs in trying to achieve each one of these things, and you know, resilience and productivity in some ways are uh, are counterproductive. So, how do you balance those trade-offs to to achieve these these three competing goals? You have to deal with all of them at once. I'm sorry, but that's the way it is. And um, uh, thank you. So in, in the framework in a in the framework that I presented, I also spoke about how you need to have uh, policies for information, uh, but also making sure that you have for the most vulnerable who might fall off the cracks when your policies do not address uh, address them, right? Um, and the role of information, because when we talk about resiliency, for example, it's not just about local governments building dams and lands to prevent. Uh, floods and levees and all that, but it's also trying to inform populations not to go build in those risky areas uh, and to make good decisions for themselves, right, rather than always having to rely on, on, on local governments. So there are a lot of solutions that address uh, resilience um, and inclusion quite, quite well and just finding the right ways of doing it in a comprehensive manner would be important. Any other questions from the, the audience? Yeah, this one there. Uh, can I just ask a very simple question? Yes, absolutely. Uh, is there any criteria as to any local government or city uh, qualify for the World Bank finance or help? Sorry, say that again? Uh, is there any particular criteria involved? Any particular criteria for? Uh, for any local government or city, uh, to be able to qualify for the uh, grants or loans yes. from the World Bank. Yes, we do classify uh, cities, uh, governments, uh, uh, many criteria, right? One is um, uh, whether you qualify for either grants. Either grants are basically for low income uh, countries. There's a certain threshold of um, what to, to be qualified uh, for, for either. Uh, either grants is basically almost zero interest rates. It's, it's, cup, it's credits. And these are for very, very poor, poor countries. Uh, and then IBRD, we do loans, but at concessionary rates for development uh, for mostly low income and, and middle income countries as well. And, but that's a threshold that we, we classify countries. Uh, and it's on the web. I don't remember the classification, right? Uh, and also, there are many other criteria that uh, would, would, we would consider as well. So for instance, if Aman wants to borrow from the World Bank is a subnational loan. We need to ask ourselves then 
you know, are you credit, are you in a position to borrow because with high debt levels, it's, it's difficult? And if so, would the central government uh, do guarantees? And it's a lot of considerations, basically, uh, in, in the world of uh, finance. Uh, but we do, we do have criteria, at least for which countries qualify for IDA grants and which country qualifies for IBRD uh, loans. Yes. Um, I have two questions. Yes, please. My first question is related to this because I was curious why Saudi was actually a recipient. Yes, yes, of yes. Okay. okay. So I think that's yeah, yeah. So Saudi Arabia is a different. It's called a reimbursable advisory service. They don't. They are not borrowing to invest. It's consultancy. It's consultancy. So we actually compete with people like BCG, McKinsey for like uh, advisory services. Uh, thank you. Yeah. And my second question is a more general one yes. because yes. I think you pointed out very acutely um, sort of the urban development issues that Amman is facing, yes. but also the economic um, uh, economic issues that yes. they are facing, yes. including youth unemployment and basically yes. a lack of jobs. Yes. So I was curious in your project, um, World Bank Group is very diverse, yeah. whether there was also an economic uh, strategy advisory element or that was something that uh, yes, yes, he I, did not uh, um, no. like he needed and so it was just left up to him. Yeah, I mean, some of these policies are at the national level. So I do have colleagues working the national government <laughs> on issues on economic growth and trade policies and you know infrastructure that matters. For example, connective roads to the port infrastructure to the sub, that sort of thing. We do. Uh, it's not under my uh, my team, but we do have colleagues who work on those issues uh, concurrently as well. So what I showed is just one small aspect of what we do in in Jordan. We have an evidence based approach. Do you outsource the research or statistical analysis part to uh, somebody else, or you have an in house expert? We do both. So um, we do have. It depends on the question at hand, right? Uh, if it's something that requires very robust, uh, you know, models and needs to be owned by the bank, we do it sometimes internally with the help of uh, experts from academia to also provide inputs. Uh, for projects and programs, sometimes we, we hire a lot of uh, external consultants. Uh, for example, to work on the, the tree charts, we hired an external consultancy to help us develop um, the model. So it, it's both, basically. Any other questions? We have five minutes left, yeah. So any other questions from there's one year and then the lady at the back? Uh, I know the, the, the World Bank do anything to boost mental health. Sorry? Uh, the, the World Bank, so how privacy boosts mental health? Or how does? How oh, does the biodiversity boost mental health? Mental health. Uh, how does? World Bank do anything about mental health? Yeah, I'm sure my colleagues in the health sector will be able to answer that question, but not in our project. Uh, oh. But I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure there are, uh, you know, possibly assistance on, um, you know, thinking about health issues, both mental and and others uh, with the health global practice, actually. Thank you. Um, I'm just curious, a slightly philosophical question. Have you ever encountered a, a recipient or partner who had very different ideas about what development should be than the World Bank is used to? If yes, how did that conversation go? If no, what factors would you use to determine whether or not to partner? Uh, so first question is disagreement with uh, s solutions. Yeah. Absolutely, we, we always debate on what the solutions are. Sometimes they're very entrenched um, solutions. And the first thing you need to do is to understand why, right? So I'll give you an example. In, in Bangladesh, Dhaka, which I, I worked a lot in, the, the may, again, the mayor asked, can we do a livable city, right? And, and of course, uh, the first thing on the head is congestion, right? Lots of congestion. Um, and then we were coming and say, let's make walkable cities more public spaces. Like they didn't square off. And then we had this uh, big park, and this is how do we improve walkability? But the government was saying, how do we build a highway above, under, and through it? And it was like saying, no, of course not. You need to do it differently. Uh, and we, we debate over, over such issues. And, but the, the, I think the important fact is that you 
you have these debates and you understand why because you know after having the discussion i realized that it's because having a highway is super visible that you are doing something if you have a park people think you're not doing anything like what are you doing mr mayor you don't what are you doing just a park but if you do a highway say, oh wow you're doing infrastructure that's that's great right so really trying to think change that approach is is uh, is very important discussion helps and bringing evidence base and global experience also helps right you show what other cities are doing uh, you know you, you show what singapore is doing with the park connector network and stuff like that and people get excited and they want to do it in their own city as well it's part of that 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 ongoing conversation we have with city government what was the second question again oh i mean it was more like if you hadn't encountered something like that then how would you what factors would you use to decide whether or not to actually work together but, but you, we don't, but we really don't have a choice, right? When we work together, it comes in a formal request. The government says, please, World Bank, we are seeking assistance and we want $500 million to do this, this, and this. And then, okay, Jonker, you are assigned to this. Go do it. So you have to make it work. We don't say, like, oh, sorry, I don't like you. You, you, know, you don't agree with me. Let's not work together. But we, we try our best to find solutions and uh, bring in or even shape it differently if, if it doesn't work out or what, what makes sense. But at the end of the day, for the World Bank, it's about development, uh, protecting vulnerable people, livability, solving the poverty issue. These are the key things that we, we care about. And that's a lens that we often we go by to make sure that these financing often goes to this or even public goods like climate change is becoming very important. We have time for one more question. Is there anyone else? Yeah. Uh, I'm curious if uh, the World Bank actually uh, helped with a refugees program. Yes. Those who are in uh, Bangladesh. Yes, we do have uh, my colleagues from the disaster risk management team is working with the um, the region on the Rohingya crisis. Uh, I, I don't really know what they're doing, but I know they're working in close co uh, a partnership with, with UN and other agencies uh, to provide financing for solving some of these issues with refugees. We do. Okay, I think that's all the time we have for, for questions. Um, I think I'll hand back to Sanjana. Yeah. Um, thank you, everyone, for participating in this lecture. We would now like to thank Mr. John for sharing his um, dean's practice and research. It was very amazing. <laughs>